In the last episode, we covered the first 4 billion years of our alien planet's history, including the evolution of complex multicellular life and the resultant explosion of biodiversity from which emerged two body plans. As of yet, these body plans only serve as theoretical blueprints, but with the passing of millions of years, the various descendants of these ancestral forms may undergo heavy modification as they diversify into separate lineages, or clades. A clade is a group of species that share a common ancestor, represented by a single branch of the Tree of Life along with any and all branches that stem from it. For example, snakes form a clade of reptiles, but also form part of a larger clade along with lizards, a group known as the squamates. And in turn, squamates can be grouped together with tuataras under the even larger clade Lepidosauria. However, Lepidosaurs and turtles do not form a single clade, because not all the descendants of the last common ancestor are included. This visual representation of the relatedness of different clades is called a cladogram, or phylogenetic tree. The next step in creating our alien biosphere is to construct some cladograms for our two body plans, and to do that, we need to have them undergo diversification into different clades. This diversification is likely to be driven by adaptation to different modes of life, or, more specifically, to different niches. An ecological niche is essentially the role a given species plays in its ecosystem. The precise definition is multifaceted and may take into account the species' habitat, feeding, reproduction, and its relationship to other species. Clades will often specialize for a group of related niches, such as how the big cats have occupied the niches of large predators. However, a single niche cannot be occupied by more than one species within any given ecosystem, or else the two species will be in direct competition, which would ultimately lead to one of them going extinct. This will be important to bear in mind later on, but for now, we first need to identify the niches present in our ancient sea and see how our body plans can evolve to exploit them. To start with, the vast majority of energy input in almost all ecosystems will come from sunlight, which in our ancient oceans will power the metabolisms of billions of photosynthetic microbes. Specifically on this alien planet, though, there is another source of energy in the form of atmospheric hydrogen sulfide, which, although it's been gradually depleted over the past few billion years, still provides energy for rafts of chemosynthetic microbes that float on the water's surface. Together, these autotrophs will form huge clouds of plankton in the surface waters, serving as a virtually inexhaustible source of food, and thus the basis of the food chain for the majority of oceanic ecosystems. The term plankton refers to any organism incapable of swimming against the current, including these single-celled autotrophs, or phytoplankton, as well as a host of tiny animals, or zooplankton, that feed on them. One group of animals that's very likely to form a large component of the zooplankton are the anthostome larvae, whom we've already said live near the surface before descending to the seabed to complete their metamorphosis. These larvae will likely feed in a similar way to the adults, using their feeding arms to catch food particles. While they are capable of controlling their position in the water to a small degree by waving their feeding arms, the larvae aren't able to move independently of the currents and so still get classed as plankton. The polypods may have some representatives among the zooplankton as well. One major advantage the polypods have when it comes to adapting their body structure is their segmentation, as individual segments can be specialized to perform specific functions, allowing for increased body complexity. This can be seen in many clades of arthropods, annelids, and even vertebrates, which, although missing any external signs of segmentation, show a pattern during embryonic development of tissues arranged in repeating units, which then differentiate to form various aspects of the body structure in much the same way as other segmented body plans. One way this specialization of segments may manifest is through tagmosis, the fusion of multiple segments into a single morphological unit, or tagma. On Earth, many groups of arthropod have independently undergone tagmosis to organize their body into different regions for a specialized function. One very likely development is for some of the anterior segments to unite into a tagma dedicated to feeding. If we say these polypods undergo tagmosis of the first two segments, then the limbs on these segments could specialize into appendages for handling food. Further tagmosis may fuse the third, fourth, and fifth segments together into a tagma dedicated to propulsion. The limbs may broaden and develop elongated bristles, or setae, to enlarge their surface area. Spasmodically beating these limbs provides short bursts of jerky movement, reminiscent of the antenna-driven swimming of Daphnia, or Cyclops. 
The segments posterior to the locomotive tagma, no longer being needed for propulsion, may evolve to form an enlarged gill surface and to house the internal organs. In particular, their reproductive systems may adapt to increase fecundity, the number of offspring an individual is capable of producing. Plankton tend to have very high reproductive rates, as their only real defense against predators is sheer numbers. These tiny polypods may live much like copepods on Earth, comprising thousands of species and forming a large proportion of the biomass in the ancient seas. I'll call this clade of polypods Tachypodia. The tachypods and the anthostome larvae may serve as prey for larger zooplankton. While most anthostomes are filter feeders, there may be room for them to expand into other methods of feeding. Perhaps rather than passively straining the water for plankton, they can adapt their feeding arms into tentacles for catching larger prey. To increase their feeding surface, they may evolve a body cavity, like a stomach, which will make their feeding much more efficient. I'll call this innovative new clade of anthostomes the gastrozoans. The larvae of these gastrozoans will develop a stomach as they mature, allowing them to feed on zooplankton such as the tachypods. While still classified as plankton due to their inability to swim against the current, the gastrozoan larvae may grow quite large before their metamorphosis, possibly living in a similar way to jellyfish, drifting through the water and ensnaring passing prey with their tentacles. All of these various planktonic clades form an abundant food source for larger nectonic clades. Unlike plankton at the mercy of the ocean currents, nectan are species capable of independent movement thanks to adaptations that enable efficient swimming. The ancestral polypod accomplished this with back and forth strokes of the many limbs that lined its body, but this is by no means the only option for effective aquatic locomotion. By undulating from side to side, the whole length of the body can be used to exert force on the surrounding water. This is called anguilliform swimming, and is used by many clades of fish, as well as aquatic reptiles and polychaete worms. If a clade of polypod evolved this form of swimming, it would grant them much greater speed than the limb-driven swimming of their ancestors, allowing them to diversify into the niches of large, active predators. This clade may be descended from the same stock as the tachypods, and so inherit the same feeding tagma consisting of the first two segments. In these creatures, the feeding arms may become grasping tentacles lined with setae, which may be adapted into sharp spines for catching and impaling large prey, or into long baleen-like bristles to filter plankton. Since thrust is provided by the lateral motion of the body, the limbs are no longer needed for propulsion, and so the anterior limbs may now serve as stabilizing fins to support the body and maintain depth, while the posterior limbs may become completely vestigial and thus shrink to reduce drag. And as this clade further specializes for fast swimming, the final segment may evolve a fin to increase the volume of water displaced by the tail's movement, and therefore provide greater leverage against the water, allowing for the evolution of more specialized forms of swimming, such as corangiform or thunniform swimming, in which the central mass of the body is kept mostly stationary, while the propulsive force is provided solely by the movement of the finned tail. With this design, this clade is well equipped for predatory niches, including shark-like pursuit hunters and whale-like filter feeders. Let's call these creatures acanthopods. Meanwhile, anthostomes aren't anywhere near as mobile as polypods, even in their larval form, so they may be excluded from such predatory niches in open ocean or pelagic environments, but they may have more luck in benthic environments on the seabed. Here, nutrients filter down from the surface waters in what's called marine snow, which constitutes the main food source in the lower layers of the water column. The majority of marine snow will be taken up by benthic filter feeders like the adult anthostomes, while the remainder collects on the ocean floor, forming a layer of detritus that serves as food for other benthic creatures. This creates a niche that may be occupied by another clade of polypods. Let's say this clade splits off from the main line before the tagmosis of the first two segments, and thus represents a sister clade to all other polypods we've discussed so far. Tagmosis will be a useful innovation in this clade as well, perhaps this time involving the fusion of the first four segments into a feeding tagma. The first, second, and third pair of limbs may form a frond of tentacles for filtering and handling food, while the fourth pair may be designed for burrowing or digging through the sediment for organic detritus. These limbs may bear setae like the other polypodian clades to help them sift through the sand, but may also be used as a means of sensing vibrations in the water, giving them a way of detecting incoming predators. The remaining five segments may form a second tagma dedicated to locomotion. The gills on all of these segments may fuse into a single surface on the creature's underside, 
and the fifth pair of limbs may evolve into specialized fins that beat back and forth to pass water over the gill surface to increase oxygen intake, much like the pleopods of some crustaceans on Earth. The sixth, seventh, and eighth pair of limbs comprise the primary locomotor limbs. What were once fins used for swimming may now be adapted into rudimentary legs for crawling over or burrowing through the substrate. While the ancestral polypod had limbs made of simple muscle, these benthic polypods may require something more robust to support their bodies and give them leverage to dig through the sediment. The limbs of the ancestral polypod likely evolved from extensions of the gill surface, and so the base of the limb may occur very close to the hemocele, since oxygen needs to be able to diffuse through the gills directly into the blood. Perhaps in this clade, an offshoot of the hemocele could extend into the limbs, which would provide them with more oxygen and also help maintain their structure through hydrostatic pressure. A muscular valve around the base of the limb may allow this outgrowth of the hemocele to be successively inflated and deflated with blood, which, in conjunction with movements of the leg muscles, will allow the limb to function as a sort of hydraulic piston. This mechanism is also used by starfish on Earth, which have a complex water vascular system that pumps fluid into and out of the tube feet to move them along the seabed. The final pair of limbs, however, may lose their locomotive function and instead be developed into gonopods, limbs specialized to aid in reproduction. In this case, allowing these polypods to lock their bodies together during sporting and to facilitate the transfer of gametes. This clade will live much like crabs and lobsters, sifting through the detritus for organic matter. I'll call these creatures sarcopods. In the deeper layers of the sea, they'll be safe from most pelagic predators such as the acanthopods, but the benthic environment will come with its own predators. We've said that the gastrozoans have evolved a gut and the ability to ingest prey, and this capability extends into their developing larvae. Perhaps this reaches its pinnacle with one final innovation. Neoteny occurs when traits associated with the larval or juvenile stage of a species are maintained into adulthood. Sometimes this may manifest as a species losing the ability to metamorphose into adults, completing their entire life cycle in the larval form. If this happens in a clade of gastrozoans, then instead of attaching to the substrate and becoming sessile upon reaching maturity, they may evolve to remain motile throughout their whole lives. Freed from the constraints of a sessile existence, this clade of gastrozoans may now specialize for active predation, which may entail some severe changes to their body structure. As we touched on last time, among animals on Earth there is a strong correlation between motility and bilateral symmetry. It could be that bilaterally symmetrical animals are predisposed to motile niches, and thus occupied them before radial creatures had the chance to adapt to them, but there are some examples of motile animals with bilateral symmetry that evolved from radially symmetrical ancestors, as can be seen in one of the most criminally underrated animals on Earth, the sea pig. These are a clade of sea cucumbers that have evolved a motile lifestyle to help them forage across wide areas of the ocean floor. Sea pigs belong to the phylum Echinodermata, the same phylum as starfish, which means the sea pigs' ancestors exhibited radial symmetry, but as they evolved to become more motile, they secondarily evolved bilateral symmetry. This provides some evidence that bilateral symmetry will be favored in motile animals, even if they descend from a radial ancestor, so the same thing may occur in our neotenous gastrozoans. When they first evolve lifelong motility, they may propel themselves with wafts of their tentacles, or by dragging their bodies along the seafloor like octopuses or brittle stars. Eventually, cephalization may kick in and a single direction of movement may develop, around which a plane of symmetry may form. As discussed last time, it's likely the mouth will form the front end of the animal for efficient feeding, and consequently the arms surrounding the mouth will move forward as well. In the ancestral anthostomes, these arms serve many purposes, including respiration, feeding, and sensing the environment. Upon evolving bilateral symmetry, these limbs may become individually specialized for specific functions. Some of the limbs may become sensory stalks that let the animal detect and zero in on prey, equipped with eyes and a series of vibration-sensitive setae. These organs are especially delicate and would pose a huge threat to the animal's survival if lost or damaged, so the ancestral condition of being able to retract these limbs may come in handy, in much the same way that snails are capable of retracting their eye stalks. Other limbs may become specialized gills with an enlarged surface area to increase oxygen uptake. Like in the polypods, these gills may contain an extension of a hemocele, and muscular contractions within the base of the limbs may pump blood between the gills and the rest of the body. 
Meanwhile, still other limbs may become feeding arms to force prey into the muscular mouth. These limbs may evolve sharp hooks or teeth to help grip prey and masticate it before ingestion. Note that because their digestive system evolved from a single cavity formed from the feeding surface, these creatures won't have a through gut like the polypods, where food is ingested at one end of the animal and waste is expelled at the other. Instead, food is digested in the stomach and then waste is regurgitated back out of the mouth, similar to some flatworms and jellyfish on Earth. The remaining limbs may be used for locomotion, beginning as simple tentacles that drag the creature along the seabed, but then eventually evolving into more efficient feet or flippers. While they never become fully sessile, they may still develop the same mineralized armor that the adults do, still serving as defense against larger predators. However, this armor will still at least partially restrict their movement, so they'll likely be outcompeted for the niches of pelagic predators by the acanthopods, but they'll thrive in deeper waters, feeding on the sarcopods or other benthic animals living among the detritus. But the evolution of motility provides these anthostomes with another advantage. Recall the sessile anthostomes are committed to broadcast spawning, meaning they produce vast quantities of gametes, only a very small percentage of which are fertilized and survive to adulthood. By developing motility, the neotenous anthostomes are now able to actively search for a mate, minimizing the distance the gametes need to travel and thus substantially increasing the chances of a successful fertilization. The ancestral anthostome would have produced gametes from internal gonads and then expelled them into the water through gonopores at the base of the feeding arms. However, in the gastrozoans, as the stomach evolved, these gonopores may have migrated inside the body cavity, meaning that the gastrozoans, including these new neotenous forms, will produce gametes from a gland on the inside of their mouth, which means that they eat, expel waste, and secrete sex cells all out of the same hole. Yeah, nature can be gross sometimes. And one final note on reproduction, most anthostomes only develop a reproductive system during their metamorphosis into adults. This means that before they mature, the larvae are neither male nor female, completely lacking any sexual characteristics. Then, once they metamorphose, they become either male or female, perhaps based on certain environmental cues such as temperature or the availability of certain nutrients, rather like the developing embryos of crocodilians. But since these neotenous anthostomes never undergo metamorphosis, they will instead gradually develop a reproductive system once they reach maturity, with the same delayed onset sex determination as the other anthostomes. With this suite of bizarre traits, I'm going to dub these bilateral gastrozoans tentaclostomes. And with that, we've got a pretty solid outline for the ecosystem of our ancient oceans, and a fairly extensive cladogram for both of our body plans. Keep in mind, of course, that evolution on this scale takes millions of generations, and for every clade we've developed, there are likely to be innumerable intermediary forms, as well as many other clades that have either gone extinct, or simply aren't included for clarity. This will represent our ancient ocean's ecosystem for the first 100 million years or so following the emergence of the two body plans. However, while the oceans are brimming with life, there's still one habitat yet to be colonized. In the next episode, we'll see how the descendants of these marine creatures haul themselves out of the sea and take up residence on dry land.